Hey guys, it's Abby. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a Reddit no sleep story. This is quite a long story, but it is so fascinating. So get your popcorn or some kind of snack and be prepared to hear a terrifying story about a haunted abandoned hotel. If you guys like this video, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. And if you're new here, click the subscribe button down below as well as the post notification button so you can be notified anytime I post a video. This is going to be a two-parter, so you're gonna wanna be notified when the second part goes up. And other than that, let's just get right on into the story. story comes from the user Christian Wallace and it is titled, I live in an abandoned hotel and something keeps sending me gifts in the dumbwaiter. I don't have a home. I did once, but not anymore. My kids have sold it and I don't blame them. I should have been there for them, especially at a time like that, but they only lost a mother. I lost a piece of myself. We spent 40 years together. She was my first kiss and we were just nine years old. Tiptoes under mistletoe. Over a lifetime, we built something together, something beautiful and intricate and just for us. And then she died and I was left behind. Afterwards, I felt so alone. Other people's company, even my own children's, felt wrong. Hollow and thin like cardboard. No solace. I'd lost half of myself and it hurt like hell. During the funeral, I had to sit there and eat sandwiches my daughter had thrown together on a platter, listening to sad offerings from people who were aware of the hole in my chest but couldn't do anything about it. And like a black cloud, the thought of my empty home descended upon me. What was I going to do when everyone went back to their families? when my children finally returned to their lives. It was only the first night after I checked into the Dunraven Hotel that I understood the gravity of my decision. I wasn't going back. I wasn't going to pretend that life still had meaning. I sat in my room, ordered a drink, and waited. And 15 years later, I'm still waiting. Even after they shut the hotel, even as the building crumbled, as the wallpaper peeled, strangers looted and wood began to rot. I remained. Aging, but still alive. This place has made me a different man. I've had to adapt. I'm a scavenger, a squatter. Desperate, cold, and hungry, but it's her absence that I feel most as an aching in the chest, even after all this time. Maybe I'm punishing myself. I don't know. I think I just wanted to be someone else and this place made that happen. It feels like a lifetime ago that I stood in my garden and cooked burgers on an open grill, listening to my future son-in-law prattle on about football while my wife and daughters laughed in the distance. I'm so far removed from that man, I'm not sure we were ever the same person. Now there is only this hotel. What a special little place, Dunraven. Faded brass handles on every door, patterned red carpets throughout the halls, cheap but upscale. Bigger on the inside than most people expect. I don't know how I found it, but I did, and now I'm its sole caretaker. Occasionally, ghost hunters arrive at Dunraven thinking it's haunted. Stories typically focus on the victims of the hotel's most infamous killer, a manager who poisoned hundreds of guests, and whose actions finally forced the building to close permanently. No one could quite figure out what she used or how she pulled it off. There were concerns over black mold, maybe some unheard of chemical or an illicit hallucinogen. Her testimony amounted to little more than babbling hysteria and she spent her final days in an asylum. No one could say for sure what would happen, but the damage was spectacular. Over the space of 18 years, tens of people died and it wasn't from some mundane sickness. They imploded in glittering lunacy, fermenting in dark corners while their minds grew full of holes. It took months before the scale of the madness became clear. One guest hanged himself with a running jump from the roof, head first like an Olympic diver. One, a doctor, died trying to remove his own appendix in the dining room while the other guests kept on eating. And one group of 11-year-olds visiting the coast on a field trip gathered one morning in the foyer and beat their smallest member to death while their teachers sat and watched grading each child by their performance. Guests who stayed here during this period dreamt of boiling tar and blood-red oceans as far as the eye can see. They reveled in their own destruction, their minds melting at the edges while morality flowed loose like hot wax. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Even when it was open, the staff and ever-changing rota of the town's adolescents hated and feared it in equal measure. Half the rooms were forbidden to guests and staff, even back then. New hires would sometimes break the rules, but only once. Those who served food to the woman in 312 found that she would whisper such strange things to them, even through the closed door. Most found her harmless at first, but not after they had gone home and glimpsed her pallid hands beneath their bed, or caught her folded up inside the refrigerator, muttering dark reflections of their own private thoughts. If you pay attention when you visit the Dunraven, you might notice that pinned to the wall of every floor and staff room is a list of these barred rooms. Attentive hires would have noticed 312 was on that list, 
with the addendum that all food service requests to its occupant were to be ignored. Ever since the hotel became a derelict, I carry a copy of the list on me at all times along with some addendums of my own. Some rooms are relatively safe. It's easy to go into 804 and avoid the red leather chair that has dissolved more than a few geriatric guests looking for an upright nap. But other rooms are a death sentence. In 614, something strange lives beneath the bed and has an unnaturally long reach. Its twisted limbs are able to reach down the hallways and stretch around the corners and are adept at maneuvering the vent system to catch whatever poor soul left their scent in the room. On several floors, you may notice grates and vents with damaged covering. And despite the manager's best efforts, you will almost always find a brownish residue hidden in hard to reach places such as the thread of a screw or in the seam of a weld. This will be one of the places that 614's residents finally caught up to a victim with violent consequences. From what I read in the then manager's notes, it could wait hours before striking. God, Dunraven is something special. A lightning rod. A glass bulb mid-explosion. A thousand stories make up history so bizarre it raises questions about the town. How could anyone ignore this place? How could anyone keep it a secret? You won't find references to this place online, and I suspect there's something a conspiracy. A dossier, perhaps, buried deep in the Westminster's archives. If so, it can only offer a sliver of the understanding I have gained from living here. Everything I need is in this hotel. Nine stories, 600 rooms, nearby a crumbling Welsh coast, and a grey sea where old things wash up on the shore. Touch the soil or the sand anywhere between the hotel and the water, and know that staying here is a place to yourself and the path of a story so old that it risks crushing you beneath its tread. It is no surprise to me that the Dunraven still stands even years after its closure. Outside the front gate lay three bulldozers rusting. They came to bring it all down, but that was 12 years ago. Where are the men? Yellow vests and hard hats litter the ground, thrown there in a panic. Whatever plans there were to demolish the Dunraven, I doubt they're still in motion. For the best, I think. What would they do with the stairwell, bricked up when it first arrived, I have since opened it, although it took a few breathy weeks with a sledgehammer. Back when there was staff, they bitched endlessly about the owner keeping it closed off. They couldn't understand why they had to shuffle everything up and down the main stairs, where guests often berated them for getting in the way. One looked down the forbidden stairwell, and I understood well perfectly why it had been sealed. It was huge, far too large for a building like this. I dropped a brick and never heard it land. I shone the light and counted more than just nine stories. A lot more. It hurt to stare into the vanishing point. Suddenly, the floor beneath my feet felt a great deal less solid. I was standing on something flimsy that overlooked a chasm deeper... Chasm? Chasm. Chasm? Chasm. Okay. I was standing on something flimsy that overlooked a chasm deeper than anything I'd ever seen. I have climbed those stairs for over a day and not found the bottom, but I have found old expeditions. Skeletal figures clutching their own necks, covering their mouths, faces frozen and whimpering rictuses. Most look like lost teenagers dressed in jeans and hoodies. On the lower floors, I even found a few that looked like military officers from the Great War. Deeper still, a few skeletons were draped in ancient chain mail. How do you bulldoze something like that? You drive a big yellow machine into that stairwell, and all that's gonna happen is you're gonna lose your big yellow machine. That like makes me feel like Mount Everest, kind of. Like it's giving Mount Everest vibes. I avoid that place like it's radioactive. Who knows what might live down there? Subsisting on unseen things? Instead, I spend my days going room to room, scavenging the things that people left behind, listening to what the walls have to say. The history in this place is a haunting connection to so many forgotten lives. You can feel it like a sympathetic heartache. One room, the bedposts have worn through to the carpet, digging grooves into the wooden slats beneath. They still squeak with a rhythm that is familiar but hurts the ears to hear, like a manic rat scribbling its way through a tight passage. And it's dangerous to linger at the threshold, to even risk placing a hand on the door. You can lose days to its effect. A heady mix of confusing thoughts and emotions, like being possessed by another's garbled dreams. The few times I've been unlucky enough to get caught in its effect, I have woken up days later, sore and sleep deprived. They locked the room up in the 30s after the fifth set of fatalities, and knowing what I do, I'm surprised it took that long. Victims died of dehydration, bed sores, foul infections, and septicema contracted through unhygienic practices. On one occasion, the staff kicked the door down to find the guests gone, leaving behind only sodden clothes. Whatever happened in there, I don't know, and I don't want to. Like all of the barred rooms, it has a dumbwaiter an ancient mechanical elevator that plums the same depths as the stairwell. I suspect whatever forces are at play in that abyss leak upwards through the open shaft and into the hotel. It may even be the source of all the strangeness. I can find no record of the dumbwaiters ever being installed or even used for their original purpose. I've checked, and the dumbwaiter in my room should descend straight through the bar on the ground level, cutting through several stools and the countertop but whatever route it actually takes seem to circumvent traditional space. It sends me gifts, 
or something does, down there in the dark. Throughout my time in the Dunraven, I had always heard something shuffling around down there. Nothing as severe as footsteps, but it was never particularly quiet either. Could have been a great opening up in another room to access the same shaft, or maybe something coming loose and falling down. But once the hotel was abandoned, the sounds grew louder. Bangs and clatters, muffled thumps, and maybe even grunts. I couldn't say for sure. Sometimes they might wake me, but I would lie there with groggy eyes and only the vaguest hint of what the sound had been before drifting back off. I thought nothing of it for months, until one night I awoke, much like I described, confused and exhausted, but something was different. I was instinctively afraid. Staying still, I scanned the room, which was lit faintly by the moonlight, and noticed the dumbwaiter's grate was open. It was cold, and in my sleep I pulled the covers up to my chin but the window was shut, and I soon realized the draft was coming up and out of that ancient shaft. Shivering and afraid, I pulled the covers up closer to my face, and then there came a sound from the darkness, an awful metallic screech, shrill but thunderous, some ancient mechanism being forced back into life, deep in the guts of the building. It passed quickly, and I wondered what it was, but before I could summon the courage to get up and close a dumbwaiter, the sound repeated. By now I was wide awake and I quickly processed that whatever it was, it was far, far below me. This gave me some relief, but only a little because the sound came again, and then again, and again. And I realized with mounting horror, someone was operating the elevator, heaving hand over hand on the winch to raise the platform, rattling the chain and shaking the rust off a centuries old machine. Again and again it came, one pull after another, until soon there wasn't a break between heaves. And then freezing cold and terrified in my own bed, I could no longer deny what my ears were plainly telling me. The dumbwaiter was getting closer to my floor. For some reason, my brain picked this moment to remind me of all the children who have gone missing in Dunraven over the years. Of countless parents who idly spent a few hours in the bar below, only to return to their rooms, finding nothing except ruffled sheets and other subtle signs of a panic struggle. And I imagined what those children went through. I imagined them like me, lying in bed, hearing the dumbwaiter approach with a wailing mechanism, unable to shake the thought that something had entered the enclosed space and was pulling itself inexorably up towards them. Did they pull the covers over their eyes to hide it? Did they crawl under the bed? Did they wake with the breath held as the screeching sound came to a halt and there came the quiet sound of inhumane muscles climbing out of that tiny metal box? Did they imagine that if they stayed still, perfectly still, it might move on to gobble up some other child? Did these strategies ever actually work? By now, my nerves had thoroughly conquered me. I could only watch until at last the lift came into view. A pitch black box. In those handful of seconds, I found eternity, each one stretching out far beyond what any human mind could endure. As I stared into the shadowed recesses of the dumbwaiter until at last, the something stared back. A pair of yellow eyes and a single three-fingered hand reaching out to clutch the open hatch. For a moment, the world felt dizzyingly unreal, but I couldn't break the tension. I could only lie there and shiver and wonder if my heart was finally going to give in and burst inside my chest. I'm not sure how long it really lasted, but in the end, the arm reached out and pulled the grate shut and the sound of tortured metal began again. Slowly, the mechanism lifted itself out of sight. When the sun rose, emboldened by the light of day, I ran over and made sure the damn thing was shut firmly and that nothing else lay in wait just out of sight. Briefly, I wondered if it might have been a dream, but the fresh scratch marks on the inside of the dumbwaiter's shaft said otherwise. I decided to change rooms. But this would not be the end of it. If I chose a room without a dumbwaiter, it would take less than a week before another appeared in the wall. No matter how much I moved, all I accomplished was spreading the damn things all over the place. There was no avoiding that thing. Most of the time, it would pass by my room, wheels screeching as it dragged itself up from the basement to God knows where. But some nights, the grate would open and those yellow eyes would leer at me from the shadows. And while it never crept out and brought my worst nightmares to life, I could not stop it from glaring at me. Nor could I stop the paralytic fear it instilled in me. I have obviously been at risk of the Dunraven in the past, but that is always because I have gone trespassing into one of the many forbidden rooms. This was the first and only time that something I had done Raven seemed to take notice of me, and even worse, to give pursuit. And it did pursue. No matter what room I chose, a dumbwaiter would soon appear and not long after that thing would follow. Not every night, sometimes as infrequently as just once a month. But how often would you need to go through that for it to affect you badly? I found it increasingly hard to sleep, and yet somehow, Impossibly, it got stranger. About a year after it began, I woke to find the dumbwaiter already at my floor. Lit as it was by the morning sun, I could immediately see there was no yellow-eyed thing lurking in the wait. But that didn't mean it was empty. Something had been placed carefully upon the platform, 
neatly centered, almost presented. A broken down old pocket watch with a faded brass lid. Filth and grime caked it inside and out, but still I got the impression that it had once been valuable to someone. After a bit of polishing, I found an old inscription on the inside. It was my Christian name, but I had never seen it before and attributed it to coincidence. After that, the gifts kept coming. A peculiar range of sentimental keepsakes from God knows who. An album with photos of a young man in the RAF. A missionary statement from the same man's time spent preaching in Africa, judging by the common name. None of it meant anything to me. Sometimes there were even practical effects like a woolly hat in winter, or a good pair of boots after mine fell apart. It would take years of me collecting these strange things before I noticed an odd relationship. If I displayed the most recent gift anywhere in my room, or it would be visible from a dumbwaiter, the creaking nighttime visitations would stop. In this way, I think I found the only real gift that I wanted which was to simply be left alone so I could sleep soundly. Around this time, I noticed some of my own personal effects went missing. Most of them were things I didn't care about, and the thefts were so infrequent that they were hardly worth worrying about, especially considering the sleepless nights spent staring into its eyes for what could be hours. But the one that distressed me the most was a tin box filled with the last letters I received from my daughter. I hadn't read them. Things had turned sour between us after I left, and I knew where they were headed. Still, it was nice to have them, to know they existed. Other than that, the thefts were minor and soon stopped, but the gifts still come around once or twice a week, even to this day, in a way that only deepens my connection to the place. I don't know why, but out of all the strange occupants of the Dunraven, I fear that thing the most. It's the way it looks at me. I don't know how to describe it. I have only ever seen its face once, a living nightmare that haunts me to this day. It began with three film students who I stumbled across as they wandered the lobby, cooing at all the pretty destruction. I caught them as they joked about returning to the Dunraven to shoot a full-blown horror movie a childish cackle echoing down the halls. And that is where we're going to end the story today. This story is so long, but it is so fascinating. It's honestly like a miniature book. So I'm going to film part two right now. Let me know what you guys think of the story so far. I think it is fascinating. It honestly gives me like American Horror Story Hotel slash Cecil Hotel vibes, which I love. I'm a big fan of like haunted hotels. And again, if you like this video, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. If you're new here, click the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications so you can be notified when I post other videos and when part two goes up. And thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Bye!